up here incredibly blessed by you today as we stand in your presence and as we give you the worship you deserve, no matter where we are watching this from, you are deserving of the worship. And Lord, here you are just trying to bless your people. And Lord, you are pouring out a blessing upon us. And I pray that we would be a people to receive it. And I pray, God, that we would take off all those things that reject the blessing that you're trying to put on our life. God, you're trying to intervene in an incredible, miraculous, divine way in our lives and do the unexpected, the very thing that nobody believes will happen. And yet I do hear those things happening in people's lives. I'm experiencing those things myself in my own life because God, the blessing is real and it is from you and it is to our people, to our singles, to our families, the young, the old, the in-between. It doesn't matter your color. It doesn't matter what we look like. It doesn't matter how much we have or don't have. God, the blessing is from you and it is to us if we will receive it. And I pray that we will today. Lord, I pray that we will have open hearts to receive your blessing. And God, we are grateful that we can be reminded of it in our time of worship today. And so God, we offer you now our hearts because God, as we are leaving this point of worship, as we sing, Lord, we continue to worship with our hearts as we open them to you. And that Lord, we would allow you now to speak into our minds, into our hearts, deep into our spirit. Because Father, we need from you today. And we need you to fill us up. And God, your promise is that you will. And Lord, you've already began that incredible work. So thank you for it, God, today. And we just say as your church, we bless your name. And let's all say together wherever we're at right now, amen and amen and amen. Yes. Wow, it is good to be with you, Heights Church. I am so excited that you are with us wherever it is that you happen to be. And when I think about the message that we're about to dive in today, I'll tell you what this is. It is an invitation to live better. That's exactly how I would describe the passage that we're in right now in Acts chapter three and four. And I'll tell you what, your first fill in right now is uh, coming. So you got your notes. I want you to write this down. You get your pencil, your paper. You should have them already out. If you don't, run, go grab them. Don't spill your coffee. Go grab them and here's what it's gonna be. Your thought is this. We could use more examples we could use more examples. That's our big thought for today that I want us to look at. We could use more examples. I think about when I was about six years old, I remember a day we were out, my father and my mom, my brother, we were all walking through a neighborhood and there was some construction going on in the houses and we were walking off the sidewalk through a yard. And I remember that we were, for whatever reason, walking in the front yard of this construction house. It wasn't ours, we were just walking in it. And I remember thinking to myself as a little boy, six years old, I have heard this phrase, I want to walk in my dad's footsteps. I heard the phrase and I saw the footsteps and I thought, here's my chance. And I just started hopping from one to the other because my dad was a big man and I was just six. And so I'm going from one and I've got to really stretch to get to the next. And my mom could see what I was doing. She said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm walking in daddy's footsteps. You know what? We need examples in our lives. I think about my junior year of high school when I gave my heart fully to Jesus that was the time when I fully laid everything down. I'd been in church for years. I knew a lot of things. But I'll tell you what I didn't know is I did not have a personal thriving relationship with Jesus. But then I did. I had given my heart to Christ. And I remember that summer, I was just voraciously devouring the scriptures. I, I just sat in the gospels, which are the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're the first four books of the New Testament. If you haven't read them, you need to start that immediately. 
And these gospels, they're unique books because the gospels describe the life and the teachings of Jesus. So it's just these four books. And so I'm reading through them and I read through them all that summer, all four books. And I remember as I was going through it, I was wondering, what am I gonna read? What am I gonna read? I've grown up in church all these years. I was listening to the stories, but I've never really read my Bible. And I thought the whole thing was gonna be full of these and thous and don't do this and don't do that. And to my surprise, what I found was Jesus teaching, but I also saw a lot more than that. Things that I had heard before, things that I knew. Do not steal, of course. Do not lie, of course. Don't commit adultery. Well, can't really do that. I'm not married, but I get it. Don't lust. Don't do this. Don't do this. Be honest. Blah, 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 blah. And all these different things. And I heard that. But I'll tell you something else that stood out to me stark was I got to see Jesus come alive in the gospels. And I saw an example of how to live the teachings that he was giving. He wasn't just sitting in a chair and saying, hey, write this down, write this down, write this down. He said, here's how you live. And then he said, watch me. In fact, what he said was, follow me. Now, I'll tell you what, his example is what we look to. And so often I'll hear people say, oh, I've read the Bible, I know what's in there. And I would say, yeah, that's true. But I can tell you that each time I look into it, I find something new and it may not be a new teaching, but it's a new fresh way of seeing the example that is laid out before me that Jesus or one of the other great people in the Bible uh, are able to give me. Those examples are so powerful and so incredibly needed in our lives. I think about the Bible itself, all through it, it is an example. I think about the church itself, this community of people around us, it is meant to be an example. It's about the perfect, the imperfect, the, the really wrong and the really good. You see all of it in there and how these things are worked out. We see good examples. We see bad examples. We say, hey, don't do that that way, but hey, do that that way. And we see examples. I'll tell you what, we could use a lot more examples in our life. Our families, our neighborhoods, our city, our nation right now with all of the confusion, all of the rage, all of the, the emotion that has reached a, a fever pitch at this point, we could use more examples in the midst of the confusing, confusion that are going to guide us and inspire us and we can follow. And you say, well, Craig, what topic are you talking about? I'll tell you what topic, it's all of them. That's what we offer. That's what Jesus offers. He offers an example for all of them. So we could pick the topic, but we look to scripture and say, you know what? Here's an invitation to live better. It's an invitation to live better. And we could use more examples of that. And as we're talking about that whole idea of examples, I'm just gonna say more of that coming in just a moment. But let's pick up the story where we left off last week, which is this amazing story of Peter and John as they're walking to the temple and they're about to teach literally thousands of people. They're walking up to a gate called Beautiful. Now, if you were with us last week, you know the details of the story. I won't go into it in heavy detail, but there is a lame beggar. They know this guy uh, in the sense that they have seen him. I don't know that they know him. I don't think they know him at all, actually, personally, but they know of him. They've seen him, and he has most likely seen them. But on this day, as he is begging, they say, look at us. We don't have any silver or gold to give you today, but what we do have, we will give you and we offer you life in Jesus' name. Get up and walk. And he was completely miraculously healed. There was all kinds of turmoil that was going on because there were a lot of people really excited about it. And then there were a bunch of people who weren't all that excited about this man's healing because it meant that Jesus was actually real. And so in this moment, this man's dancing around, jumping around, hopping around, and the people are saying, hey, wait a minute, maybe I I want a miracle too. Could you tell us more about it? And so then Peter begins to teach this crowd. And so now there's more people listening in and he begins to tell them about Jesus. And he's telling them about how he was crucified. In fact, people in that very crowd were the ones who pronounced crucifixion on him and caused him to be murdered by Rome. But it was at the hands of the very people who were in this crowd. Jesus is, te or rather Peter is, is talking to this crowd. That group of people are in that crowd. Crowd. This is a dangerous place. 
But we see that the presence of the living God is with them. And so amazing things continue to happen anyway. And so this is going on. They begin to teach this, that, and the other. Then they get dragged into uh, court because the Sadducees, rulers of the temple, don't want them to do it. So they're calling them on the carpet. And so you see this whole scene playing out in chapter three and four. They are eventually released. But as it's all playing out, I want to touch on a few of the the passages here, the the verses here, because these are really important for us to take a look at when we see what God is trying to do, this invitation to live better. And it starts off with this, and this is in your notes as well. Your second fill-in is this, is that God is trying to refresh you. We see it in Acts chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. Let's put the verse up on the screen. It says in verse 19, Uh, Peter says, how do I receive God's refreshment in my life? He says, repent of your sins. In other words, turn away from your sins. Turn to God though, so that your sins would be wiped away. They would be cleansed, taken off of your life, taken out, cleansed like detergent through a white towel that's been soiled. And now it is white, it is whole, it is pure all over again. And it says, let it be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come, he says, from the presence of the Lord. And your fill-in is that God is trying to refresh you. God is trying to refresh you. So here Peter is talking to this crowd of people who are in a lot of confusion themselves. The life that they are living under Rome's heavy hand in Jerusalem is a very challenging, painful life. They are eking out life day in and day out here in the city of Jerusalem and in the surrounding areas. And Peter stands in front of them and says, hey, I want you to know something. God is actually trying right now to refresh you. I don't know if you know that, but I'm here. He sent me here to tell you that he's trying to refresh you. So let's talk about what that word refreshment means. It means it's a picture. It's a picture of relief. It's a picture of rest. And I don't mean like, hey, I sat down and you know, sat for three minutes. I mean a good sleep rest. When was the last time you had a really good sleep rest and you woke up in the morning and you said, wow, that's what he's talking about. That's the refreshment that he's talking about. I'll tell you what it also is, it's a ceasing of agitation. And I know what we know what that means. We feel that agitation in our life. It's a ceasing of the agitation, the affliction, distress, the painful effort and grief. It's ceasing all of that. In fact, it's peace. You know, refreshment sounds pretty amazing, don't you think? And it's the very thing that God is trying to pour into this group of people. And then that's why Peter is there. He says, guys, I want you to know something. Jesus came to give you refreshment. You thought it was something else, but God is still, even now, trying to pour refreshment into your life. And I want you to know, this is not a cease fire. No, 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 no. This is a true peace in the midst of the war zone that the enemy of your soul has created and stirred up all around you. And I want you to know that as we are here in our own culture, nation, this moment in our history, we're facing a lot of different issues and there are many, many voices and a lot of confusion out there and a lot of passion. And I get it. The issues are real. The issues are very important that we get to the other side of them if we can as a nation. I get all that. But Peter speaks into a culture, into a people that are dealing with at least what we're dealing with right now as well. And his word to them is God's trying to refresh you. And I need us to know that as people who are following Jesus, that's the same thing God is trying to do in our life right now. He's trying to refresh us in the midst of all of this confusion. It is possible. In fact, it's not just possible. It's what you and I are meant to walk out of. And when we are refreshed, when we experience that peace and when we can let confusion go to the side and we can start to sort all this chaos out and we can see it as the way that God sees it, then we 
can work out of that peace and truly be a healing hand in the midst of it all, starting with the relationships that you have in your own home, your friendships, all around you. And that's how God wants us to be. That's where he wants us to start. That's where he wants us to get to. And he doesn't want us to leave. He doesn't want to leave it. I'll tell you what, God is too good to leave us in this chaos that Satan, the enemy of our souls, has created all around us. God does not want to leave us there. He wants to refresh us in the midst of it so we can be strong and make good decisions, have our wits about us and hear the voice of the Holy Spirit guiding us through it. Because the last thing God wants for all of us is to live life stressed out, driven by anguish, grief, wounded, afflicted, and in pain, running from one empty promise to another. No, 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 no. He wants to bring refreshment. Peter points to Jesus, and he says, I want you to know he's trying to refresh your life. Vacations are not going to be the answer. Some of us, we're going to have spent maybe ten, twenty thousand dollars uh, on vacations sometime this year or next and say, oh, it's going to give me the refreshment. You're going to get a reprieve. But I've already talked with many people after they come back from those vacations and they left God out of that vacation. I'm just going to tell you right now, you're going to feel exactly the way you did before you left about two days after you get back. And God says, you know what? The refreshment doesn't require you going to Hawaii or anywhere else. You can have it in your own life right now with me because that's what I bring, is I bring refreshment into your life. I think about a bike ride, our 106 degrees, just earlier in the week, I'm out on my bike, I'm doing a 21 mile ride, and I get into the ride and I was at a spot, spot where I was just absolutely parched. I mean, I, I just dry. And uh, I remember taking a drink of that nice ice cold water out of my water bottle. And oh my goodness, it was awesome. It was so refreshing. And then I started riding again. And about 10 minutes later, I needed another nice, fresh drink of that ice cold water. It was so refreshing. Oh, it gave me energy for the next 10 minutes and then another 10 minutes and 10 minutes. And then I ran out because I didn't bring a second bottle with me, which I should have done. I'll do that next time for sure. Um, But here's, here's the thing. You know, during this whole time, of the COVID crisis and of course, all of the other social unrest that's going on in our country. I can tell you right now that I am taking time right now in my own life, not because I you know, just have luxury to do it, but because I absolutely have to. I'm taking more time now to refresh my spirit than I ever have in my entire life. And the reason is because you know what? It's just what's called for. Sometimes you need it every 10 minutes. Sometimes you need it every couple of hours, but I don't know what it is, but I do know this. The only way I'm gonna be refreshed is when I allow Jesus to actually bring that refreshment into my life. And I hope that you're doing that. And here's my question to all of us. Are you an example for others of God refreshing someone? Are you an example to others of how God refreshes somebody to the people in your own home, your friendships, people in our church, your life groups, people that you work with, do they look at you and say, oh man, they're such an incredible example of allowing God to refresh them whenever it is that they're needed. That's just what they do. I mean, they're so good at it. And uh, wow, it's made such a huge difference in their life. Are you an example of someone who has allowed God to bring refreshment in your life? And that is exactly what we're called to, because I'll tell you what, we need more examples for people to follow. And then they will see what's happening in your life, and then they're going to want to do those things in their own life and recognize this is the very thing that God intends to do in me. Oh, it's what I want. And then we move on to the next verse, and this is in verse 26, and it says this. When God, this is what Peter says to the crowd, when God raised up his servant, Jesus, he sent him first to the people of Israel to bless you, meaning the crowd, because most of those were Jews at the temple, bless you by turning each of you back from your sinful ways. In other words, hey, he's here correcting you. He's telling you you're on the wrong path. And then the next verse tells you that he is, uh, actually, no, yeah, there it is. Yep, next verse. 
There we go. It says, you are included in the covenant that God promised to your ancestors. For God said to Abraham, through all your descendants, the families on earth will be blessed. All the families of the earth will be blessed. And guys, as we are here, there's a, a two points that I want to make here on this. The first one is this, is that God not only is trying to uh, 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 refresh you in your life, but God's actually trying to pour out a blessing on your life as well. Now, the blessing and the refreshment, they are actually a little bit different. The blessing is, is when God is truly intervening into your life. He's doing an incredible, miraculous thing. This blessing is God's intervention to accomplish all of the good things that he wants for your life. God to be with you is one of the blessings that God says, you're not gonna do this alone. You're gonna do it with me. I'm gonna do it with you. That's how it's gonna work. I want to bless you. I wanna pour a blessing. And here's Peter. What is he saying? He goes, it's an invitation to live better. We need more examples of what it means to live better. And guess what? Crowd, I want you to know God right now with my very words is trying to bless you, intervene in your life. He's trying to come and be with you. And you may say, well, I've heard that, that God wants to be with me. And so my question would be, great, then why aren't we allowing him to be? Every single day, we have an opportunity to allow God to be with us. And yet too many of us are just giving way to the fear and we're giving way to the confusion. We're giving way to what people say, oh, you're supposed to be doing this. You're supposed to be doing that. And all the while God's saying, stick with me, follow me. I will lead you through all of this. We will find the way, the path that I have for you. And Jesus is the one who has already laid it out for you. He's the one who can navigate through these really difficult waters. And you know what? As people watch you navigate through all this chaos, at some point in time, they're going to be able to look at your life and say, you know what? There's something absolutely divine. There's something extra. There's something very different about this person. It's almost like they are blessed by God. I think about a gentleman by the name of Joe Alston, and he's somebody that I got to know as a high schooler and then as a young man as well uh, in ministry at our church. And I think about this man. Joe was one of these guys that truly, when you were around him, he worked at Hewlett Packard. Uh, you know, if you were to just read a re resume, you would say, wow, he sounds like, a, you know, a, a guy that you would meet uh, often. But here's the thing. When you met Joe, you, you recognized that Joe was different there was something very different, very significant about Joe. He was a man who was blessed by God. Joe would be the one who would serve first in the room and he'd serve last. That's just the way it went. I never saw the guy go to bed before anybody else. He was always the last one to bed. He was the first one up. He was the one who served whoever was needing to be served. That's the way it was with Joe. And Joe would lead any time that it was called for. Joe was an incredible man who walked with God. And you knew that he walked with God because his life, it just oozed. Jesus, the calm of Jesus, the wisdom of Jesus, the confidence and the perspective of God. And I didn't ever see a selfish bone in this man's body. And I think about this man Whenever you were with him, you just felt like you had seen someone who was so absolutely unique. Now, I happen to know Joe a little better than many, and I happen to know that he wasn't a perfect man. And I happen to know that the reason he was able to live in this way is because that man met with Jesus every morning and he laid down his heart. He surrendered his heart and his life to God. And it's the reason that he was able to receive that blessing of the Lord, that intervention of God, and all of these things that we look at and we say, Joe, your life is amazing. It's incredible. It's, it, it's, it's the goal for so many of us. And Joe, Joe would say, if he were here today, would tell you that it's because he was able to make room in his life. You see, it's an exchange. You have to set down my best ideas and what I want and how I think I should be able to do this or live my life and be able to pick up those things, receive those things from God, which are a true blessing. See, Joe could set one down 
and take the other up, receive it. But if your hands are full, you can't receive the blessing of God. And I need us to know today that as we are hearing this passage, as we're being challenged by God to receive the blessing, some of us, the reason that we're not receiving that intervention that we're really looking for is because God's asked us to lay some things down and we haven't done that yet. And he knows that we can't actually hold what he's trying to give us yet because our hands are already full. And so we need to go before the Lord or we need to lay these things down. You see, this is the reason why God would say, hey, I could give you freedom from that because he wants to bless you. He could say, hey, I don't want you to do that. Why? Because he wants to bless you. Hey, how come you won't do that? Because he wants to bless you. Hey, how come you don't pray with your spouse? I'm trying to bless you. Hey, ask a friend to pray with you when you know that you're hitting your limits because I'm trying to bless you. Hey, reach out for help and encouragement. Stop doing this alone. I have created and provided an entire church for you. I'm trying to bless you. And I know that may surprise some of us. And we, we hear these thoughts of, oh man, I hear God telling me to do this and to do that. And it's just like Peter saying, hey, you need to surrender. You need to turn away from those sinful ways, those things that are separate and away from God. Why is he saying that? Because you're never gonna receive the blessing of God if you're walking that way. But if you'll stop and you'll turn around, then you're gonna run right into him if you go this way, because that's how it works. And that's the mercy of God. Did you know that God is trying to refresh you? And did you know that God is trying to bless you? He's trying to pour into your life. But to receive God's blessings with your hands that are already full, you're gonna have to lay some things down. And you say, well, I'm not sure what that is. And I would say, yes, you do. And yes, I do. I know there's at least one, two, or three things that I could put on a list right now because there's always one, two, or three things, and there's usually a longer list that God is speaking to my heart about, and I know it's the same case for you. You don't have to know everything. You just need to know what the next things are on the list. And when we start laying those down, then God can lead us to the next thing and to the next thing. And the next thing I know, God has intervened in my life, and I am suddenly living out life at the sight of Jesus as a man who is blessed or as a woman who is blessed. I have a friend I was talking to uh, just this week, and he, he said, my father actually said this to me. I'm sure glad that you joined that church because there's definitely something different about you, but I don't want to hear about the fire and the brimstone. Now, the way the father's talking about the fire and the brimstone, he's certainly talking about those things that he knows God does not want for his life. But what the truth is, is that it's actually as I lay aside those things that God doesn't want for my life, that I make room for the blessing and the intervention, the whiff that God is trying to actually make possible in my life. And I know what we're talking about here. You know what I'm talking about here because these are the things that we wrestle with when we can actually be quiet in our own hearts and in our own spirit. When we actually can listen and really, really hear the voice of the Lord, you know what? It doesn't take long before we start hearing God actually speak to us about these things and he wants to pour his blessing into our lives. People want the blessing, but they don't want to set aside enough they don't want to set aside enough of it or set it down in order to get much of that blessing that God's trying to pour. Our big thought for today is, are you an example of someone who is being blessed by, the God, by God, who's receiving that blessing of God? Are you somebody that when other people in your family, your friendships, your, even people at work who don't even know the Lord, they recognize it about you? In fact, I just heard a story of uh, one of our ladies here at our church. She's in a cohort. All of the other people in her cohort in their, uh, uh, mass, their, their, their education program uh, don't know the Lord at all, don't go to church at all, but they have already identified her as somebody that the Lord is with. So much so now that they have actually started asking after they were failing some tests that if she and her husband would pray for all of the cohort before they took their test, they actually asked asked her to do that. And that's exactly what they did. And of course, they passed the test with flying colors afterwards. 
And I hope they studied as well. I'm pretty sure that they did. They probably studied a little bit harder. But my point is they actually recognized that this person that they're in class with, there's something different about her. Oh, I love that. They, re- they recognized that God's blessing was on her life. Well, guys, we're going to stop it here. We're going to pick this up next week because my last two points are too crucial for us to cruise through, and they really speak to our times. And so I want to stop here for this moment and just challenge us. Are we allowing God to bring that refreshment into our life, that peace and the cease, not a ceasefire, but an actual peace to the raging battle that's going on around us so that we can walk in peace in the midst of it? That's what God wants to do. That's what refreshment means. Are you allowing God to bless you, intervene, do those things in your, his, in your life that he wants to do that are miraculous, things you can't do on your own? The things that he says don't do and you're still doing, God says, I can't bless you until you take care of that. I want you to do this, but until you do, I can't bless you until you do that. I need you to put down your best ideas, Craig, so that I can give you mine. And so, Father, we're grateful right now in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you that we have this passage, and thank you for Peter and John as they would stand so bold, as they would walk into this crowd of people that they know were actually responsible. The people responsible for crucifying Jesus are literally in the crowd listening to them talk about Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to live bold lives in this way as well. Lord, live these incredible examples for other people to see. In humility, yes, not in arrogance. The Lord, just walk in humility, just like Joe, a man that actually on the outside was quite unassuming until you got to know him. And in the first three minutes, you knew that there was something very Jesus-like about this man named Joe. Father, I pray that you will make it clear what needs to be set aside in our life for that blessing to come, that intervention of yours to come. And Lord, I also know that part of that blessing is gonna be healing from past wounds, whether that was yesterday or whether that was 30 years ago, but we're still carrying them around. And Lord, our conversations today are still guided by those wounds. Lord, I pray that we will allow the blessing to come. And Lord, right now in this moment, we just choose the things that you have identified, you've already shown us. Lord, what is in the way of us receiving that blessing? We need to set it down so that we can receive what you wanna give us. Lord, in this moment, if you're, at the, if you're ready for it, I'm gonna pray this prayer with you. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Oh God, I take this that you have identified, you've shown it to me. Lord, I need to put this aside, set it down so that you can give me now the blessing in my life and you can intervene in a divine way and heal and allow me me to receive from you, oh God, what I need that only you can give to me, whether that is healing, whether that is peace, whether that is strength, whether that is confidence, whether that is forgiveness, whether that is mercy, whatever it is, God, that I need to receive from you, Lord, I choose to set this aside and make room for that. But Lord, I also know that there are those here listening that they recognize they're not walking with you and that they want to open their hearts now to Jesus. And so if that's where you're at, I just want you to pray this prayer with me. Oh God, I open my heart to you and I invite Jesus, your son, into my life. And I ask that you would forgive me of my sin, Lord, the filth, that is in my life, and I know what it is. A lot of other people don't, but I know what it is. And Lord, I set it aside. I ask that you would forgive me. And Lord, as I make room in my heart, that you would fill me, cleanse me, that only you can forgive. And Lord, I ask that you would come and live with me in my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit as you promised to do. And so I now receive you in Jesus' mighty name, and I choose to walk with you as a son and a daughter for the rest of my life. Thank you, God, for that. And Lord, we're grateful for your blessing today. In Jesus' name, amen.